Travis, we're back with a vertical YouTube live stream. And in this vertical YouTube live stream, just gonna check that everything's going good here. Um, well, it looks great, yeah, it looks phenomenal besides this little white cable in the shot, which I don't like. What is this thing? Get out of here, I don't like that. This is a professional, professional show. So yeah, guys, we have a ton of cameras on the desk here, but um, what we're actually gonna do is I'm just going to quickly uh, kind of chime in and talk about kind of comparing these two these two main cameras, the Sony ZV-E1, which is right here. It's a beautiful camera. It's a lovely camera, and the A7C2, which is also a beautiful and lovely camera. Now I'm putting this on a piece of paper because I actually did buy this and I'm just trying to don't tell anyone if I don't want to keep it I do want to potentially return it but I'm probably not going to return it because spoiler alert off the initial rip I rented this from Lens Rental shout out Lens Rentals initial rip um, from this oh you can see my little iPad in the shot I like that iPad boy um, is this camera is just a gem like look at this thing when you see this thing, like on your desk across the room, and you look at it, you're like, whoa, is that a RED camera? It reminds me of a RED camera just sitting there how it looks. It's kind of boxy. A7C2, this is the black one. I would have preferred, and I do want the silver one. Um, again, I'm going to be honest here. I kind of, let's clear some clutter off the desk too. I thought it'd be cool to have the clutter on the desk, but it's a little distracting. Ooh, what's this? Oh, the A7S III? Oh, who's this little guy? Oh, what's this? Oh, a little lens. A little 20 to 60 Sony kit lens. Hmm. Which came with this guy. And that was nice because I actually got this for the usual price with the kit lens for the price of just the camera. So it's kind of like a, a sale that was going on. The sale just ended, unfortunately. So, sorry you missed the sale. But it was a pretty sweet sale. Since you got this $500 lens for free... And then wasted uh, 200 bucks to rent the A7C2 from Lens Rentals because my OCD never sleeps. <clears throat> but um, to dive back into this comparison, now, really what, what was scaring me the most from the A7, uh, the ZV-1, was what's not here, the lack of EVF. The A7C2 um, has an EVF right here. Now, really, the only thing I was obsessing about trying out and seeing and wanting to like like what's the deal here was i wanted to see if this evf was any good right here now another spoiler alert uh it's not very good <laughs> it's usable um but it's not great it's not great at all to be honest let me just show you i'll put the zv1 in the four shot right here we have the a7s3 just doing its little thing right here Oh, it's so lovely. Oh, what's this? Oh, like a little GoPro 11. Just the whole squad. The whole squad's just hanging out. They're all friends. Now, the EVF, back to the back to biz here. The EVF. Now, it doesn't even really, like, it's, supposedly the A7 III has a war, better EVF than this, but I'll tell you what, the A7 III, which I sold to kind of get one of these cameras, um, that EVF was garbage. That was literally the worst thing in the entire world. It sucked so bad that you didn't even really know what the shot you were you were getting. Like I could have maybe messed with the diopter more, figured it out. But you'd look in that A7 III EVF and you'd be like, it'd be like a horror movie. You'd be like, oh my god, what the? And the back screen of the A7 III like sucks too. So you don't, you never even knew what you were shooting, and you kind of assumed like, oh this footage sucks. And you go to your computer and look at the footage, you're like, oh wait, this footage is awesome. These pictures are awesome. So the S7 III, to be honest, by the end of it, it never was like that fun to shoot with. It also didn't have the flippy screen, which really doesn't even film on yourself. Yeah, it helps a lot to film yourself with the flippy screen. But more importantly, get the little Manfrotto things out of the way. More importantly, though, the flippy screen also kind of helps you like create angles. Like say you're over here filming this way. The camera's here and you're filming that way. Okay, there's a flippy screen. So you can go like that and see what you're filming. Without the flippy screen, you, you can't even see that. So you can't even see the camera, what you're filming, on any angle besides, like, just behind the camera. Now, it's more for photography, and you can get a, 
like a monitor on top. But really, the flippy screen comes in handy a lot more than just filming yourself. Just a lot of the different angles you can get, you know, that you can't get with the, without having the flippy screen. That new Sony screen that's on the A... R5 or whatever that kind of flips and tilts up and does all that. It's probably the best. But really, all I need and what I really just like is having like a nice flippy screen. Um, because at least if it flips, you can film yourself and you can get those multiple angles I just talked about. Now let's talk about the EVF on here. So now when you put your eye to it like this, my eyelashes like hit this thing and it's just like weird. Like, I want it to be good. And really, I, I spent 180 bucks just to rent this for a few days. Literally, just look at this EVF. Because I was freaking out. Because I kind of use the EVF all the time for videos. I use it to check focus. I use it to, like, assure the composition of the shot is correct. And a few other things. So, I, I really like just looking in the EVF. Just to kind of see everything. Now, when you do that on this, here's what happens. You stick your, your uh, eye in here. And for me, it's like so small, my eyelashes hit the rim in the bottom. So I actually kind of have to like back up a little bit. And then it's like playing, don't put your eye too close to the EVF or you're going to poke your eye out. You could probably get a thing that goes over top of that. That would probably fix the issue. Um, the A7S III, which has the best EVF in the whole world. Um... What's great about this is like it actually has some covering you can see this and it's like hard as well. This has like a nice soft covering. You put your eye to this and it's you're at home. It feels great. And then the image is awesome. This is like a 9 million dot, dots in there. This is only I think 3 million. Um, and it's just like good but I thought I just had to see for myself. Like I still this is the first time I've used an EVF to the side. It's also kind of weird because when you use it like this. Let's put a little thing right here. Maybe, oh, maybe the A7S III can go here. I just don't like that foreground not having nothing. Let's see how this looked. Oh, whatever. But so when it's to the side like this, one thing that happens is you put your eye in and then your nose hits this. You're like, oh crap. So that's kind of weird. I don't know why it doesn't do that on the A7S III. It just, your nose actually kind of sits in the middle. So it just hits this. This, it goes on the screen so you get little nose smudges. Um, so even if you go like that, that alleviates it. But again, I would need to buy the, I mean, I assume there's an extender piece. I haven't looked up, but really it kind of just right away. I was like, oh, like the only reason I really would want this over that is for the higher megapixels and the EVF. Um, this is definitely more for video because, um, I needed a, a, basically a B cam for this guy, the A7S III down here. And for a long time, I wanted to get the A7 IV, and then I wanted to get, you know, the A7S, the A7 II, which is right here, um, A7C II. But it kind of just didn't really, like, for some reason, I just kept Bojangling. And then by the time I was going to buy this new camera, there was like six different cameras to choose from. There was the this, the ZV-1, there was A7C2, there's the 6700, there's the R5, it's a million dollars at the global shutter. There's all these new ones. I even started to think, well, I'll just get another A7S III, which I made a video about. And I kind of started to play the buy used A7S III's, found a super cheap one. It was just kind of too cheap and wrinkly. And long story short, I bought a brand new one of these for the same price as that. And when you're spending two to three grand and the item's already kind of beat up and used, it's it's not the best feeling for some reason. You're just kind of like, oh, did I just, it's, I mean, it's a workhorse. A7S III, you just don't even got to baby it. You know it's going to work. I want to have the A7S III pretty much on every shoot. And I just always want it with me because I know how it works. I've had it since 2020. And I just, I can trust it. It's never overheated on me ever. Ever. I even shot one time in Palm Desert. It was like 110, felt like 130. A7 III was just shutting off all day. <laughs> I was like, oh dang, A7 III is broke. But really what was happening is A7S III, they did something. Because it doesn't have a fan. It has some kind of like internal sink that somehow, I don't know what how they did it. But it's like somehow it doesn't overheat. Like I don't know if anyone's gotten it to overheat. 
but I shoot a ton of 4K 60 and it's still never overheated. On the desert day, I was shooting 4K 30, so could have been different, but again, never overheats. Now, I am more scared about this guy overheating, which we'll talk about in a sec, but just to conclude on the EVF, um, I don't know if it's if I would get this camera just, just for the EVF, just to eliminate the woes of not having an EVF. I even have stayed away from the FX30 and the FX3 and just anything without an EVF because I just I use the EVF on the Sony A7S3 so much that if I didn't have it, it would be a bummer for sure. I still don't understand how and why people use the FX3 um, without the EVF. Like I am, I need that EVF in the A7S3. So I'm still a little concerned about this not having an EVF because we'll see, but um, yeah, you just can't really trust this as much as you would hope. Now, the other thing is, for some reason, when I picked this camera up, at first I was like, you know what, like, the grip isn't, like, for some reason, this feels better when you pick it up. It's actually, the dimensions say it's a little smaller, but they kind of made it somewhat, like, thicker or something. Or even though this is plasticky and like a little more slippery, it feels a little nicer to pick up than this, which kind of feels like you get to jam your fingers in here more. That's might be what it is, is there's less, there's more room here than here. Now it's hard to see and it's hard to really notice unless you're using it. Um, make sure I'm in focus here. But, um, that part was like kind of confusing because I was like, oh, I thought this was going to be a like a substantially better grip. But then I realized that uh, the A6700 actually has a pretty deeper grip than this. So that actually, I think these days, unless you just need the full frame, like that could be a better option than this. The EVF, I think on there actually has a better eye cup potentially too. Um... But it could it could be the same. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But uh, yeah, it's not. I just wouldn't recommend getting this camera, the A7C2, just for the EVF. Like you're gonna be disappointed. <laughs> the A7 IV EVF is even better. Now other things. Now right away I turned these both on and I was trying to kind of like see which one would do better in somewhat low light. I call basically for me anything that's shot inside with like pretty crappy lights. Like right now I'm using just like a ring light and then another light here. The scene's pretty well lit, but even this like isn't, it's pretty good light. It's not like these huge film lights blasting at you, which that would be considered good light. So if you have an FX30 or an APC camera, Super 35 on film, film sets, yeah, those are smaller sensors, but they have tons of light. You'd be surprised how much light you need to expose properly. That's why shooting outdoors is super easy because the sun somehow makes like a ton of light. Even go outside and look at your eyeball, your little pupil in there will get really small when you go outside. And then you come inside, it'll kind of expand. There's just so much light outside dumping in. You know, that's why you need ND filters. That's why you never need an ND filter inside even when there's tons of lights around. You go outside, even if it's cloudy, you right away you still need an ND filter unless you want to just be in uh you know high f-stop land where there's no background blur and life isn't that fun um so just based on like picking them up like this one's more fun to pick up <laughs> okay now this is another lame like hilarious um what's the word uh consumer -y reason but like this camera just looks really cool like when you're chilling and you're looking at these cameras you're like Oh, well, look at that thing. <laughs> this just looks like a normal a uh, normal Sony camera. It's fun. It's cool. It's not really that different, though. The silver top could make it cooler. This one, when you look at it across the room, you're like, whoa, is that like a little red? It reminds me of the little red Komodo, or the little red Komodo that's white. And there's just something, like, very unique about it, just looking at it across the room. Now, one other awesome thing about this thing is this tally light right here. So this has a giant tally light, which is sick. Now watch this, so if I record, all right, that tally light's glowed up. This one, hit record, 
And then there's no tally light. There's a little blinky red light down here. Um, but I think that's kind of just a writing to the card light. I'm not really sure. It, it also is somewhat of a tally light, but that's just confirming that's right to the card. This also has that, and I think that's what that is. It's just essentially saying, oh, we're writing um, your uh, info to the SD card. Everything's good. Life's golden. But once this, once you like are in tally light land, it's really hard to go back. I mean, it's already like, you can see this one's recording, you know, the red light. Well, it's funny, right now I can't see, well, it's pretty exposed in here. Let's kind of do that. You can't, you can kind of, it's funny, you can actually see the red light blinking on the bottom, the one I said you can't see. But you can see this light, like, really good. Now, what's also funny is that I initially thought that um, this these red lights, like on the FX30, FX3, I thought they would actually, because the A7S3 sensor is like, it picks up every little detail. I thought this red light would, would show on your face. And I'm actually right. When you wear glasses, this little red light, there'll be a tiny red light on your on your glasses, like which is pretty crazy. Now, it kind of sucks if that's like, you don't want a little red light and it's pretty hard to see, but it's there. Take off your glasses and you won't see it. But I'm sure if it was like super well lit and this thing was close enough, you would probably see that red light on your little, on your eyeball. So it's a bright red light. I don't know if you can dim it or not, but I'm already obsessed with this thing because it's a lot nicer to look at this thing and just know, oh look, I'm filming. Like, look at the red lights there. Oh, hey, I'm filming. So that's pretty awesome. And this one doesn't have a tally light, which isn't awesome. So another thing, uh, these cameras kind of have that's different is it's another little minor issue. We'll I'll go over the, the cons of this first. These buttons all over this thing, they're kind of small and they're hard to touch. You have to kind of use your fingernails with everything. And that turned me off a lot at the beginning. None of the buttons are like super out. They're all pretty recessed and you gotta like kind of touch them a few times. Like, oh, did I touch it? Did I not touch it? That part definitely threw me off at first. And I was like, oh, oh that kind of sucks. Um, you know, which is kind of like a GoPro, like it's not very fun touching the GoPro buttons and it's not the best. You end up getting used to it and then you forget about it. So that, that was the goal it was like, all right, just Travis, don't get too obsessed with these old buttons now. And I'm still in the mode where I'm like changing a lot of things all the time. So it kind of sucks. These buttons are a lot better. They're more just like the A7S III. They're easier to touch. Um... Maybe a few are a little more recessed. The A7S III buttons, every single button on it is like the best thing ever. It's all perfect. It's, I mean, it's the best camera ever made, the A7S III. It's like you're back in like GH5 land where it's like, oh, this is the best camera. So it's basically a GH5, a full frame GH5 with the best autofocus ever and, um, and a full frame. So now... One thing I don't like though is for some reason the flippy screen on the A7C2, when you go to grab it, it kind of like, it doesn't have this top grab area. It only has this bottom grab area. And you gotta stick your finger in here and it's like kind of hard. Whereas the ZV-E1, it has the same thing the A7S3 has and it has this nice top grab where you can just go like that. I think the A7S3 has that too. Yeah, it's the same as the A7S3, so, which is really nice. And I didn't expect that to be some hilarious little like conundrum that, like, oh, you can't even grab this thing. You gotta stick your finger in here and like yank it out. So that part kind of sucks. <laughs> um, now other things are, it's pretty much the same back screen um, same resolution. I did have this one all cranked up and actually working pretty good. This one's still in its low mode. I just haven't messed with it yet. But having these top dials on here, just like all the Sony cameras, is nice. It's easier to kind of do that and recall your settings. I use all these memory recalls. You know, I usually have like one is 4K24, 4K30, one is 4K60, one is 4K120. This one, it's not as intuitive like that. I'm going to have to go on the menu and there's no thing up there. It does, does save space, but it'd be nice if they had that. Now, also, this doesn't have the front wheel, which kind of sucks. It only has this one back wheel. But once you kind of get used to the touching the screen, the back wheel, you can do like that, and it'll change stuff. Um, 
This one has it added the front wheel, which is nice. The A7C didn't have that. And then it has like this back wheel. It has this wheel. It has tons of wheels. It's a lot more easy to use. Um, one. So now I'll talk a little bit about overheating. So I haven't gotten this thing to properly shut off overheating yet. The light, the warning's turned on. Um, I did buy the fan, the Alonzi fan. That seems to be helping. When I put the fan on this and the A7S III, they both get up to like, you know, 40 degrees Celsius, which is essentially when this thing will shut off, 41, 42. Or no, it hasn't shut off yet, but it'll say that, and it'll be hot. This thing actually gets hotter than I thought it was gonna get. Like right now it's hot. Um, I don't know if this has been used a ton or not, but like I haven't even used it that much. And even after using it just a little bit, it gets hot, just as hot as this one. They don't feel that much different. This one just has more of the reputation for overheating, but this one feels similar in heat, and it's kind of surprising how hot this thing gets. Like, right away, you're like, whoa, this thing's already hot. I haven't even done anything yet. Whereas this, you know, the internet tells you it's going to be hot, so you're kind of used to it. Um, other things that are kind of different and the same are, you know, this has is these, like, little, I don't know how I feel about them yet, but they kind of stick out. So you can just stick the Peak Design thing on there or not. These have the typical... Um, you know, triangles, they don't they don't shake and rattle, which is nice. This is rattling just because the peak design thing's on there. Um, I wonder if this was on there, if it would or wouldn't rattle. Let's see. It probably won't rattle, actually, which is nice, because those in themselves don't rattle. Let's see. Oh, yeah, it doesn't rattle. Uh, a little bit. Yeah, so this actually does less of the rattling, which is kind of nice. Whereas this, because it doesn't have... I guess you could put triangles on there, maybe. But this... Ends up doing that, which isn't that fun. So, you can keep these things off if you need. But it is kind of nice to have those on for the, the used things. I just I just noticed this. And I'm starting to like the A7C2 more. <laughs> Um, I've kind of already made up my mind though about probably just keeping this because I've just rented this and if I bought this it'd be the silver one. I also got the lens with this, the uh, ZVE one for free essentially and that lens at 28 to 60, it's pretty sweet. I mean it's a stock kit lens but it's so small and you can kind of wrap it up like that and when it's on this thing, let's do that real quick. I'm still babying it all. So when it's on this, it's really nice because it's just so small. That's what she said. Well, not to me, but I think I made that joke in the last EV one video. So sorry. When it's like this, it's just like pretty sweet. You're like, okay, that's cool. And now the grip actually isn't feeling that great. <laughs> But they're, they're not that different. This has more texturized, and this one is just a little more like slippery. But it's so light that it's kind of nice to, like, you're not have to, you don't have to worry about this thing as much because it's, I think it's 30 grams lighter, which isn't that much. But you kind of know, you notice when you pick it up. Um, because, oh, we're getting a uh, comment from Ramprazil Pali. Which lens is it? Well, to answer your question, this is the little stock uh, 28 to 60 lens right here. Um, I'll write in the chat in a sec. And this is all, these are the Tamron Trinities. So the 70 to 180, the 28 to 75, and this is the 17 to 28. So I got Tamron Trinity land, which is pretty sweet. Um, I'll just write that really quick for the Tamron Trinity plus Sony 28 to 60 kit. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm in 2.8 land. Like I didn't really want to get this lens, but it was literally free. So the price was the same as with just the camera and with the lens. It was like a $300 savings with the lens with it. This lens by itself is $500. So, and it actually holds its value pretty good because, oh, thanks man. <laughs> so yeah, I'm pretty stuck to my little collection. This is a rented one though, so. I am, one of these is going back, probably the A7C2, unfortunately. Um, because really the A7C2, 
what I would do in the end is it, it'd be definitely more of like a hybrid and I'd take photos with it. And I'm kind of sad that I'm not going to have like a good photo camera because I gave away my E7, or sold my E7 III. Um, I don't take that many photos. I mean, it'd be nice for thumbnails and just to do an occasional travel thing. But the EVF on this thing sucks so bad. I don't like putting my eye on it because you're it, it hits your uh, it hits my whatever they're called. I'm not gonna like cut my eyelashes or so either I have to buy one of these. Um, I don't know. It's just like not that appealing. Uh, yeah. So other reasonings behind you know comparing these two are you know this one. Here's the, the elephant in the room, whatever the word is, the phrase is. So the 4K60 crop. So now don't tell anyone, but I shoot like a lot of my stuff in 4K60 the last year or two. And I actually pivoted from shooting like 24P to, I was a 24P fanatic since like 2000, since film school. Like I learned 24P, it's what you shoot, it's cinematic, it's film. At some point I just kind of thought it'd be cooler to shoot like 4K60 and actually make the timelines in 4K60 and the YouTube videos in 4K60. So I shoot a lot of my stuff now in 4K60 and I publish it as a 4K60 video. And the A7S3 is sick at that because there's no crop. And then you can still use the A, the, uh, you can still use 120p as your slow-mo. So you're not really losing anything. Like you don't, you still get a 4K slow-mo which is sweet. So like a lot of my last couple projects are 4K60 timelines with still have slow-mo is the 120p. Now that was kind of, was keeping me away from the A7 IV and the A7C II with the 1.5 4K crop. Because look, if you're trying to do like a, even a little like vloggy, um, whatever it's called, you're filming yourself like this. Because I do so much 4K60, I would get like a crop. So let's see, this is a 28 millimeter lens. So, you know, right now it's in, well, it's in HD. Uh, that makes, I messed up the settings. Let's see. Well, look, this is even in, you know, long story short, it's in 4K60. It's gonna be like a little more zoomed in. So whatever you have, it's, you know, times that by 1.5 times that, and then add that to the millimeter. So this is 28 to be like, turn into like a 30 or a 40 or something. So the, it'd be closer to you. And then also if you're filming yourself, it's kind of nice to turn on the active stage sometimes. So you turn on stability and then you're gonna be even a little more zoomed in. So really the only lens I could use with this with the selfie mode like this would be the 17 to 20 would be, you know, what's on the um, A7S III right now, the 17 to 20 Tamron. And even that, you know, it's tight. I gotta like have it way out here. It's tight and it's, doable but not ideal with this the zv1 there's no crop in 4k 60 and because the camera is a little lighter and because i got this kit lens i kind i don't really want to give up the kit lens you could actually if you're if you use it properly you can still use you know the stability and stuff and this kit lens now with 4k one with 4k 60 there's no crop but the this has dynamic stability, which is kind of a new theme of Auber. And that does introduce a 1.3 times crop. So you're kind of like almost getting what this, the A7C2 would have. It's a little less crop, but then also you're not getting that extra crop. So this is like cropping in twice because of the active stave, which, you know, let's face it, a lot of us shoot an active stave for everything. If you're on a tripod, you can turn it off. But if you're not, like anything else, like the stability helps a little bit. Now at this, um, I'm in 4K, so I'm in 4K60 right now. And let's see, am I in active stave? I'm in, it's off. So I'm gonna go to dynamic. So this is dynamic stave, 4K60. Now it's doable, but you know, it's barely doable. It's barely doable. But because the lens is so light, and I wouldn't have to record that long, like I can just at least do a little, little snippets of this, as you can probably see, maybe. Let's see, can you see this screen? Probably not, but it's like, doable enough where I'm not like so close to the camera you're like oh my god dude like back up so it's it's doable and then worst case if I really wanted to get like a proper little vloggy talk to the camera shot um I can put the Tamron 17 to 28 on there and then it's going to be perfect and it's still light enough where it's not the worst thing in the world um 
Other cool little things are, so the microphone on this, who everyone talks about, so it's like not, when you record the mic with this, it can kind of do this like AI thing where it shifts all around. And I've tested it and it's not really like the best ever, but considering that it actually does something really good where it does this um, kind of like background noise eliminator. So it has some kind of a limiter in there that compresses as well and it compresses out background noise, which is pretty crazy because that's usually a, a plugin you put onto the audio. So it's doing it in real time so you, your best bet is to turn off turn off the wind blocking. It's kind of like the GoPro and using this cool little wind jammer thing. I put this wind muff around it, turn off wind protection off. And then it, the dead cat around the GoPro actually ends up being pretty good. It's similar with this, but this does an even better job with like some somehow noise canceling the background audio, like a fan or cars and stuff. Whereas the A7C2, it doesn't do that. And even just like, I didn't even notice it was funny because I recorded something and I put these two together and it was funny how this had just had all the background noise. It had the fan, it had whatever, the refrigerator going or something. Whereas this, um, the a the ZV-1 like sounded like a little tinnier and a little less bass of my voice, but it's, it does that because it's eliminating a lot of the lower frequencies and high frequencies. It probably has like a roll off right around like 80 to 120 Hertz. And then at the top, and then it also somehow limits when like there's other sounds. So something's going on in there where it does a really good job with that. And I think it's nice how you get at least like record this audio. I would say it's like a scratch track audio or a backup audio. But then because it does record it so well without the noise canceling, you easily just EQ it a little bit and bring the bass up or the multipressor or something and it's gonna sound good. I need to experiment more. But that feature is pretty cool, whereas this is gonna have all that background noise baked in and it's just it's not as usable. I mean, even your iPhone recording speaker is gonna sound better than this. The iPhone does actually a really good job with recording audio, which is impressive. So. That's another kind of cool feature. I wouldn't just totally rely on this unless you're feeling super lazy. I record all my GoPro audio with just the little wind muff thing and it does good enough. And if I need to, I'll usually have a limiter and a multipressor and EQ if at all if needed. This is a little tinnier than I like the audio, but I still need to play around and see if which angle is the best or whatever. But it's cool how you at least have some clean audio, then you can mess with the levels Whereas the other cameras, internal mics, you're not going to get clean audio. It's going to be the background's baked in and then you're going to have to play, you know, somehow get the background noise out game. Now, Final Cut Pro has a sick feature called voice isolation. I don't know how they do it. But it does a really good job of that. But it does a better job if it's like more of a higher pitched background noise or like a little bit of like hum from a from just our static from gain whereas you're not really hearing gain when you record in like rooms like this you're hearing fans and lower vibrations so that's that's a cool little feature that i'm looking forward to trying out more um other things so again the aesthetics i think like well so aesthetics with this so because it's white there's actually some tests on youtube where People will people have shown, or I forget the YouTuber's name, but shout out. But this one actually, the white one overheated after the black one, they ZV1 in daylight, and it was like 90 degrees. Now, because I shoot so much 4K60, I'm a little apprehensive because I love shooting that. But when I shoot like stuff for clients and stuff, everyone else is in the world is still in, um, you know, 4K24, 4K30 land. So that's not a big of an issue because with the fan, I think you could really run this thing into the ground and it's going to be okay. Now, I don't know. I still don't know if you'd want to have this as like your main A cam on like a big event or like, you know, a wedding as everyone says. I don't film a lot of weddings. I'm filming one coming up soon and randomly for friends. But, you know, I don't think that ideally you would have an A7S III in one of these or an A7 IV in one of these or FX3, FX30 in one of these. 
unless it's so controlled and you're shooting 4K24 and you have these plugged in and you trust it and you've tried it out for a while. I think it's based on the model. Like literally each particular one could be bad, could be worse. That's why I wanted to buy this new because I'm thinking if it's a used one, it might have got returned due to overheating. And who knows if each in particular one overheats less or more. Like who knows? So being from like never having to worry about overheating to now having to worry about it, it does kind of suck. But just having this thing in your hand and once you start using it, and then when you look at the footage of the ZV-1, like on your computer, you're like, holy crap, like that thing's freaking amazing. Like it really is super impressive. And it looks like phenomenal once you look at the final product on your computer. It's a little deceiving because you don't think it's gonna look that good. And then when it gets on your computer, you're like, holy crap, like, that's amazing. It's like the A7S 3 when you look at the footage, you're pretty blown away. Um, with this guy, I did do a little testing already and they do look pretty similar, more than I would think. Um, I think overall, for some reason, the A7S 3 sensor, which is in here, there's something about it, just it, like, it's just an amazing sensor. <laughs> Like it makes you look good. It makes the world look beautiful. The sensor in the A7 IV and the A7C II, I just don't have enough time with it yet, but it's hard to leave the A7S III sensor because it is just like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, I don't know. I think color matching these would be easier said than done. YouTube and Redditors say it's harder, but when looking at them, just doing a quick little shot, it seemed like they looked pretty similar to me. And I... I think it would be a lot easier than I would than I thought initially. Um, yeah, the thing is too, like someone on YouTube was saying it, like you kind of like buy the ZV one thinking like oh, I'll probably return it, like not that I want to use it a bunch and return it, but like you know I'm, I'm not I'm trying to keep it super clean just in case and not do anything crazy. But you get it and you're kind of like oh, some about it because there's so many YouTubers hating on it and it just doesn't seem like and it's kind of expensive and you're like eh, i don't know doesn't seem as much of a no-brainer as like an a7c2 a 6700 an a7s3 and a7 IV. it's kind of more of an outlier and but then once you have and you start using it you start thinking of reasons to keep it and you start realizing like damn i don't want to return that thing like that thing's pretty cool and you look at it on your desk from across the room and you're like whoa there it is and it just stands out from everything else and it's like really eloquent and there's just something non-tangible about it that makes it really fun. And I know it gets um, crap due to the build quality, but I think it actually is like kind of cool. It's uh, it doesn't feel cheap. It does not feel cheap. It's light is what it is. It's very light. Whereas you pick this up and this just has the typical kind of like Sony camera feeling. And you can feel the heft in the grip and in the body itself. Or you pick this one up and it's just like, it's like nothing's even there. <laughs> Which is great too, because if you're doing like a lot of solo shooting or even like you're doing like selfie stuff or even just some like vertical B-roll to make a reel, it's nice to have just a super light camera. You can kind of just like hang. Now again, the weight does help with stability sometimes, but because this has the dynamic stay, but it's a little better with the AI stuff to get focus proper. I just realized there's like a little weird opening right there. Um, you can trust it to kind of do a little better job than non-dynamic stay. And I think not the sensor, like this sensor somehow just, even when it's like kind of soft, it's still the bee's knees and it's so awesome. Whereas with the, more megapixel sensors you got to kind of nail the focus a little more and it'll look sharp af but you'll notice when it's not as in focus because it is so sharp the thing not in focus will be sharp now another just quick thing is like the noise in the a7s3 sensor which is in here and when i mean noise i mean like the noise in the background like over here like that white wall if you zoomed in kind of just that noise up there in the random area the a7s3 has like the film grain look which is super copies and it's like you're like oh like that's awesome 
This, I think you're gonna get a little more of the, it's not gonna be as kind of beautiful in terms of the film grain. It's gonna be a little more, it's still gonna be good, but it's just not as good in low light. And those areas are kind of low light E because that's an area that is not being totally focused on with the light and the camera. So it's kind of sitting off in the distance as an afterthought to the camera's you know, sensor and the processing unit. So that's always nice too. And another thing is too, is when you watch YouTube and stuff, I'll see tons of like banding in the skies and I got it with my A7 III. A7 S3, somehow the sensor, it, it never makes the banding. I mean, I don't know how I'm, if I'm exporting like the best way, but I'll watch super big YouTubers and they'll just have tons of circular banding in their background. And I'm like, huh, that's weird. And I'll look at my video and there's no banding. And I'm like, I wonder why. And you know, they'll be shooting with an A7 IV or something that isn't the A7 S3 sensor, which the YouTube algorithm just loves and it creates just not much banding which is nice. Now, it could also be just exporting in 1080 or not exporting in 10 bit, or maybe the new HEVC does better with the exporting. But that part's really cool how like, I think you can just trust this to do less crazy stuff when the YouTube compression happens. I'm still not sure about the A7C2 with that, but I would assume it's similar to the um, A7 IV. But yeah, y'all, um, that kind of, you know, I wouldn't say wraps it up. I just wanted to go through some of the pros and cons and the fact that I just literally rented this <laughs> just to look at this EVF to see if it was going to be worth it or not. But really, it's like right now I can't, I don't, I can't afford, I don't really want to buy two cameras. I mean, ideally, I guess I could just have both of these and this would just turn into my photo camera. But again, this EVF, like I'd have to get something to go over top of it. I just don't think I can ever get used to my eyelashes hitting that. I just don't like it. I want to put my face to that and not to be concerned about what's going to happen. Um, so I would say maybe try the 6700 and maybe it has a better one or the a7 IV definitely does, but then you have a, a bigger camera. Um, you know, for just, if you just want a camera to do photos, could, you could even just try to go some other route completely, but I'm at a point now where I'm trying to match them all in, in post. So I don't, I need to be in one ecosystem kind of tied into Sony right now. The only one I would prefer is probably how Canon looks, but there's kind of a lot of nightmares going on there too. So I'm happy with Sony and they've actually been crushing it the last couple of years. And now you're almost spoiled for choice. But what they do now, as I've noticed, is they'll kind of have one or two little things that, excuse me, are kind of deal breakers. Like this doesn't have an EVF and it overheats. It's like, ah, crap, that kind of sucks. This, the EVF sucks. Oh, 4K60 crop. Oh, damn, that kind of sucks. <laughs> so it's like, you end up having to like get a few, even the a7S III, it's the best camera ever made, but then, oh, the pictures kind of suck because it's low megapixel. Now it's completely false, the pictures are actually epic, but even on my a7 III, I would, you know, you can get better pictures, but in the end, I would just want to use the a7S III because the pictures looked better once they were on social media and it went through the algorithms, the, they looked better. The a7 III, the, they would, the colors would always kind of suck and then, highlights and blown out areas they would just there wasn't enough like what's the word um like stuff in the image to hold it together so it would just essentially fall apart and be this weird like overexposed or underexposed thing that was never fun i think that's more to do with the 10 bit but i know that the more megapixels there are too it could actually hurt that a little bit and cause a little bit more noise if there is not enough light or if there's kind of a dichotomy of like super light super dark um so the zv1 it's when you're using it it's just it almost just feels like you're using like a little red or an re which those don't have evf so i think the the main point with it is is like i don't know i've never had a no evf camera for a while and i've the one reason i've never bought anything that doesn't have evf because i use it so much so it's kind of a gamble but with the lens and just kind of like how much fun I'm having with this and it's like hard to let go. <laughs> I almost just want to keep it and just see what happens. Oh, I'm, I'm actually getting something in the mail too, which is shout out camera crisis. It's like a little thing that you stick on the back of here. It kind of is like an EVF for the back screen and there's hope for that. There's hope. It could be sweet. 
could be sweet. It could suck. We'll see. But that's at least somewhat of a hope. But, you know, I'm kind of just at this point where I wouldn't mind taking a gamble because at this, there's no other camera for a B camera with the A7S III besides another A7S III. Um, I don't even see besides the no overheating. I mean, the FX30, I just, I don't want to do crop sensors right now because I shoot too much kind of low crappy light. I want to have that low light capability and it's hard to lose that with anything but the A7S III. And then the A7S III has the best EVF in the world. <laughs> so it's almost like when you get one of these, you could kind of think about it as like a backup A7S III or even like, you know, say you just want another camera that's going to match your A7S III and you can just use it places and it's so light, you can use it over top. You can like have it in your pocket. You can be shooting with two A7S III's on tripods and just have this over your shoulder or just grabbing little B BTS. I think that's actually probably the ideal world is maybe I do buy a used A7S III or A7 IV or just keep running an A7S III when I have a proper gig. Have two A7S III's and then have this guy as more of like a travel cam and just do random stuff and just keep the A7S III's locked off. That'd be in an ideal world. And then in a super ideal world, I would just have like two or three A7S III's, you know, this guy and then an A7 IV, like an A7R5, whatever the newest one is, it's like a billion dollars, it's sick. I was like, kind of miss having a good photo camera. And this whole time I've been meaning to get a lot more of a hybrid, but I just do so much more video now that, you know, it's it just makes more sense to get something like this. Um, now, real quick as well, let's just dive into some of the actual like creator reasons. Now, because now I'm a famous YouTuber, this actually is pretty sick with just some of the things it can do. Like it has this one kind of crop and folly mode, which works really good. This does have it too, but I think this one works better just because of the sensor is the A7S III sensor. And because the flip screen, this now does have all the touch, touch stuff with the updates, but this flip screen was kind of made a little more for that. And I noticed there's a couple extra features that make it a little easier on the ZV-1 than this. And also there's a something called a product showcase mode, which I'm still trying to figure out, but essentially you just hold something up like that, focuses, goes back to your face. I've always had trouble with the A7S III doing that because the A7S III, it doesn't want to leave your eye. So you'll kind of have to like grab the little focus box, trick it, but then it'll go back to your eye and it kind of becomes a nightmare. Now I know you can kind of do this, which I never knew, and that'll work, but it's almost a funny flaw the A7S III focuses so well on your face, it doesn't want to focus on anything else. So I've tested this a little bit and it works pretty good. So that has this and this doesn't have that. So that could be another thing if you, you know, just want to have that little feature, which is nice for any kind of video where you're filming something, you want to just pick up something and show the camera. It actually works really great, um, which is what I've done so far. I still haven't figured out how to properly do it with the eye thing it kind of puts you in a box and then you go like that so i don't know if you can like have the eye focus and then do that or not it might just be like a, a box focus but i still need to play with that some um yeah um i kind of i'm trying to think of any other just last little minute thingies again a7 c2 it has i think it's the same color but it has more of a black e-mount and then a little bit of orange where this has like a all silver e-mount it's really cool looking <laughs> you're just like whoa this thing this looks like candy looks like candy you want to eat and i guess it kind of looks like a touristy camera i don't like how that bangs i'll be honest it'd be nice if it didn't bang this one doesn't bang she bangs she bangs but um but yeah, I don't always have these things on there. My goal was to keep them on there, but I don't like how it does that. That makes me a little sad. What are you gonna do? My plan is to have some insurance on here because then I can just throw this around and not be as scared. Um, I do wish it didn't do that though. Let's see if the A7S3 does that. Oh, see the A7S3. Oh, see it doesn't do that. See, that's nice. I wonder if you could put triangles on there. 
to stop that. I don't know. That's weird. That doesn't hug as good as this. Never noticed that. It doesn't want to hug this thing. Oh, wait. Uh oh. Maybe if I did it the other way. Oh, wait. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Still doing it. Well, that's okay. That's a little minor inconvenience. But it could be kind of weird if you're filming yourself and you're here and... So, I don't know about that. I might have to kind of just take these off and just put these on when I want to, like, use the strap to go out. They're not that hard to take on take on and take off, luckily, you just do that. So, um, yeah, I think this, the ZV-1, I think it's kind of, to be honest, I think it's still kind of a gamble. I mean, there's, like, a lot of, when I watch videos on the YouTubes, I'm seeing, like, the sickest videos ever when the EV, uh, one's being used and when i see videos of the a7c2 i'm just like yeah it's just like yeah I'm like all right that's cool like it doesn't there's something you it's this a7s3 sensor the fx3 sensor there's just something about it that like makes it super cinematic and just epic whereas this a7 IV sensor it just seems almost kind of lifeless and just not as not as like a Canon or an IMAX movie or a Red, which this provides. So that's kind of subjective, I know. But I, when I just see the ZV-E1 movies, I'm like, oh, well, like, whoa, that's awesome. Then I watch an A7C2 movie, and I'm like, okay, it's pretty cool. It doesn't, there's something about it that's hard to explain. But um, I've kind of been yambling on and off for pretty much almost about an hour. But yeah, drop any comments about uh, anything that you reckon about the um, either of these cameras, which one you would pick. Again, I do own this one, and the goal is to keep it. I was renting this just to kind of check it out, and I'm just not that, I don't know. Maybe it's just too much like the A7S III even to like really even get that stoked on it. It's In the end, it's like if this was gone, I just had these two cameras. It'd be kind of sad. Like, oh no, where's my little ZV-1? But then you have this thing, and you're like, oh, you snap, dog. You're like, that's sick. Just sitting there, like, take center stage. Somehow, even, doesn't even matter what it does, you're just like, whoa, that thing's cool. Whereas this, you're like, all right, I've seen this a million times. whoop de doo whoop de freaking doo Um... And again, when, it, when you pick these up, it's noticeably heavy. I mean, this has a lens, a big lens on it, I guess. But, let's, and I'm too scared to do this. Let's do it really quick. Really quick. I never like doing this. So side by side. They actually feel pretty similar. Probably over exaggerating the weight differences. They feel pretty similar. It's not, there's not that much difference going on there. But again, technically this, the ZV-1 is 30 pounds lighter, or 30 pounds, 30, uh, it's an ounce lighter, it's 30 grams lighter. So an ounce lighter. Oh, up, oh, it was still on, whoops. So now I wanna have a bigger lens on this. It is a little trickier to hold. So I haven't really even taken that many photos with this. I, I think I took a couple. And again, it's more so like I'm 90% video, 95% video, 10% photo. And it's just, I'm at this point now where it's like, it's like I'm way more into video and video is so much more prevalent on the internets that this doesn't make as much sense to like kind of pick something that's a little more lacking in video to get the occasion a good photo. And now that I know the EVF just kind of isn't that great at all, it's like almost makes you almost want to grab the A7S3 and just go take photos. So 
because you can put your eye to it and your eyelashes don't hit the freaking thingy. Where's this thing? Turn it on. And your it's just eyelash city. I don't know what that says. Please extend that oh, zoom. Just right away. Right away you're getting. How are you supposed to use this thing? <laughs> you have to like kind of keep your eye a little bit away from it. But it kind of defeats the whole purpose of using it then because you've got to get close. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems better than the a7 III to me, but I don't know. It, it's not that fun. I'll be honest. It's just like, eh, whatever. Like, I don't know if it's worth $2,300 if you're going to sacrifice and have, like, the crappy EVF, whereas, like, this has its limitations, but it's kind of more of a joy to use. Um does get a little slippery. It is slippy, slippy -e er But again, it depends on what the lens you have on it. This has a little thumb indention. This doesn't. But like the A7S3 compared to like that, like this has the best, the best one. With the small rig magnesium cage, it actually has an extra few places to hold. And this is the best cage ever. Get like a magnesium small rig cage and you don't want to ever get a crappy aluminum cage again. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of starting to get a little more stoked in the A7C2. You know, I'll take a few pictures just to see, you know, if it is a future buy. Because I'm starting to think when I it does come time to, you know, my brain's like, oh, we got to buy more cameras. So, oh, no. It would be nice to have, you know, more of a photo camera. So that's where it could come into play. Or the A6700, which supposedly has a little better grip. And with the photo, I don't mind having the reach because I could always use more zoom for photos. So that's where the, the crop sensor makes a little more sense. And I don't care that much about low light because usually for photos, you'll be outside. For me in particular, I don't really do portraits or anything. It may just landscape outside photos. So, um... Yeah, guys, that uh, is pretty much coming on an hour here. So we're going to wrap it up with the quick first impressions, first thoughts, personal glance, the A7C2 versus the ZV-1. Which one do you prefer? Um, do you have any of these or any Sony cameras? Which camera do you think is cool right now or do you want to check out? But again, um, I appreciate everyone for tuning in to this live stream. And I reckon, uh, yeah. Till next time, peace.